Very good participants. Sound investing is nothing but balancing risk and reward rationally. Investors extrapolate the past returns to the future performance of stocks, and only solid earnings fail to take the stock prices higher on insane valuation. Monarch Network Capital Limited brings a paradigm shift to rational investing, and today we have Mr. Abhishek Jain, who is head fund manager. Who is an MBA in finance and CFA charter holder with about 13 years of experience. He is going to present a category 3 AAF, a capital compounded fund, by building a concentrated portfolio of undervalued, head growing companies who have a long runway ahead of them to turn into multi baggers of tomorrow. First 40 minutes, Mr. Abhishar will present the strategy. After that, the floor will be open for a question. I hand over the stage to Abhishar. So, to Abhishar. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Sivaram, uh, and uh, I welcome all the participants on behalf of Monarch Network Capital and Monarch AIF. So I will uh, basically be talking to you today about two things. First is, uh, you know, a, a very interesting, um, you know, topic that we had covered in our latest newsletter, and this is um, about our views uh, about some of India's uh, very super quality stocks, and we have done some extensive work and, you know, come up with the thesis that there is a scary side also to these super quality stocks, which the investor should be aware about. Secondly, I'll talk to you uh, about uh, Monarch AIF stock selection uh, methodology. And, um, you know, that's how we have divided our discussion. Uh, we cover everything within the first 35 odd minutes, wherein I will spend around 15 to 20 minutes um, on the first topic, uh, where also I would want to talk to you about, you know, um, some popular investing narratives and how investors need to remain balanced and not fall for the narratives too much. Also, you know, what, what may appear very popular can always not be profitable. There can be both sides of the coin. And we'll give you some global examples that why the returns can't be taken for granted, even in very, very good and super quality companies. Secondly, as I mentioned, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about our investment strategy, our investment style, and we'll give you some examples of the stocks, the kind of stocks that we look at, the kind of stocks that fit our strategy where valuation comfort is existing. Okay. And, uh, you know, we'll talk to you about our, about our fund. Um, you know, which we currently run, we have only a single fund under Monarchy IF. And lastly, I would like to talk to you about our value proposition, you know, why a fund manager is even needed and a snapshot of our performance as well as our offering. So let me just jump straight into the first topic, um, you know, and here, uh, first, you know, I want to uh, discuss on, um, on, on, on this, uh, 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 you know, point which, uh, uh, which I think, um, you know, gets unnoticed. And these are some of the popular narratives which keep coming in the market uh, based on how the, you know, the wind is blowing. And one of this is that, you know, you can select uh, select names, uh, some 30, 35 names, and you can continue to invest in those high quality companies irrespective of, uh, you know, the valuations. And you will make money uh, invariably on a three-year, five-year, 10-year basis, if not in one year. Secondly, you know, there is narrative that one should have some disruptive businesses in their portfolio, be it new age tech companies, be it fast SaaS companies, be it platform companies. And again, here, you know, the narratives when, when they are hot, you know, the, the going, uh, the saying goes that you can ignore valuations or you should value them very differently. You should think very, very long, uh, right? Um, and then thirdly, on what not to do. Um, generally, you know, the narratives come in that we should ignore um, uh, the cyclical sectors, you should ignore the infra sectors, you should ignore the asset heavy sectors, even if the uh, things are changing on ground or valuations are massively in your favor, or, you know, you can see growth in cash flows, etc. You can still kind of uh, ignore um, some of these sectors. So these are the narratives, you know, uh, which which come into the market. However, the reality of investing according to us is that there is a risk involved in all kinds of strategy, any strategy, be it my strategy, 
be it anybody else's strategy be it a growth strategy be it a value strategy there will always be you know a balance between risk and reward which needs to be seen and generally what we have seen is that in the market the last 3 year 5 year trends are generally extrapolated too much um, you know the pendulum is made to swing too much and by the intermediaries and risks are effectively forgotten you know by the investor in such cases so it's not about whether investing in a growth way or a value way it is all about you know practicing rational investing across time period and that's where you know when we did some uh, data analysis uh, you know and 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 we could uh, kind of uh, you know see um, um, that there was um, indeed a scary side to the super quality stocks we had covered it extensively in our uh, newsletter which we had released on 3rd of jan um, i think the link for the newsletter will be put up in the chat window also for you guys to go through it in your free time and what it focuses on is basically a valuation excess um, if it is to an extreme it can leave investors with years of time and value correction okay which is which generally doesn't dawn on investors so soon uh, but can be the reality uh, basically so what we uh, uh, did in terms of our analysis is that we try to you know first form a basket of super quality stocks where we applied some very strong filters like companies which have always grown you know they have given a growth consistency in abid and pat kegger they have always maintained a very high roc they trade at very high valuation because these are very good in terms of governance very good in terms of growth consistency and they are above a market cap of 5000 crore as well as they have a reported financial history of 10 years this basically eliminated all new age companies with limited history of financials or any company which which doesn't have a 10 year history and doesn't clear these filters so basically you now we could kind of select around 55 very high quality stocks and and these have great track record these are very very popular names you can see the names in the annexure in in our report um and then we tried to see that what has happened to their valuations you know um, over the last uh, 10 to 12 years and the findings were mind boggling uh, so basically as you can see in these charts um, on two matrices that we have seen ev abida as well as p uh, the increase in multiple for the whole basket this is not just for 10 15 stocks but a basket of 55 stocks the ev abida has increased by 100% versus the seven year average and it has increased by a massive 200% versus the average that used to be for the same basket in fy 12 to 17 and the same trend is uh, there for uh, pe also so basically one can clearly see that the expansion has been really really abnormal and uh, you know really significant and it has also uh, you know seen a massive increase since fy 16 and fy 17 so we in, in fact went back and try to reason this out you know why this may have happened is there any plausible reasons for such a relentless and continuous up move in the last 5 to 6 years particularly because if you see previously you know fy 12 to 17 the same basket used to trade at a 16 time ev abida and a 30 time pe right which which it may be deserving because you know this basket itself the companies are very very high quality but now the multiple has become a little bit of a you know unsustainable kind of a level so why it may have happened we saw that you know there were many large scale disruptive events which were happening you know since fy 16 and they were uncannily synchronized you know so we had demon then we had gst in 2017 then we have sebi rule changes which made you know the large cap funds invest only in large cap stocks so to a large extent we had nbfc crisis and then we had the covid crisis which might now just be ending now but it was going on for the last one or two years so basically because of these things what had happened was that there was large scale disruption in a widespread economy and for the smaller players for the weaker players it was a very very tough environment to work whereas the larger players which form the super quality companies they were able to at least survive and thrive and stand on their own feet so while they were also impacted and their earnings also slipped you know these super quality stocks but the flight to safety from an investor point of view in these companies were relentless and now we are seeing that you know the valuation excess might get corrected which i'll show you in the slides going ahead but this these events led to you know the valuation uh, for these companies moving from a premium for quality to a maybe an unsustainable valuation bubble according to us in in quality so now but you know finally 
the million dollar question for anybody any investor or for us as fund managers is like what you should do with these things it's very easy to say that these are trading at very high valuation so you know look at them so it's not like that and we are not saying that but what we did was we tried to form an analytical framework you know wherein we can try and judge that how much is the extremism in any stocks uh, you know valuation uh, with respect to what it is doing on the fundamental side in say earnings or cash flows or multiples and we basically devised a mechanism of red flag and green flag based on nine different parameters some of these parameters judge the company on their growth and ebitda on their growth in pat uh, then some of them judge them in terms of their return ratios and some parameters judge them in terms of the expansion in their multiples versus their seven year average because see these companies are not new you have been knowing discovering these companies so the past valuation or the past seven year 10 year average matters it's not as if it's a new age company where you don't know what's a fair value multiple for this company so even the expansion in the multiple is a good thing to analyze from a flag parameter perspective and we have defined the ranges for a red flag and a green flag and then we have defined two baskets a scary super quality stock which will have more than six red flags and a relatively safe super quality stock which will have um, you know more than five green flags and when we did this analysis out of 55 stocks you know we could see that almost 28 to 30 stocks were falling in the scary super quality basket and on the handful of 3 4 stocks were falling in the safe basket and the remaining 20 25 stocks were falling in no man's land they had equal green and red flags and effectively you know then we also tried to see what is basically factored in today how much is the ask rate for these companies you know in terms of the growth to justify their valuation and you know um, you will be surprised to know that many of these companies have not been even growing their cash flows and ebitda at you know high double digits they they are in the range many of them have in the range of 10 12 13 14 15 percent but not more than that but we still assumed you know a 20 percent ebitda cagr on the trailing 12 month number and 3 years continuously for the next 3 years if we assume that the ebitda cagr will be so high and the valuation multiple will stabilize at a certain premium to the 7 year average say a 10% premium to a 7 year average 3 years out okay because in the increasing interest rate scenario we believe that the global valuation multiple across countries and across stocks can come down can you know move towards their more long term average then in that scenario what we find is that 44 out of 55 stocks are returning a cagr of less than 10% and in fact uh, most of the scary super quality stocks uh, in many cases have a negative cagr also in 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 this analysis so basically you know this is what is factoring in and uh, see our disclaimer our disclosure which we have put in here also is our objective is not to suggest a buy or a sell or whether these stocks are untouchable or we don't analyze or see them but we are what we are trying to say is that investors should not take the returns from these category of stocks as granted uh, there could be periods of big time and value correction which may happen because the valuation uh, increase has been relentless and the growth has not been so relentless in many any of them you know the stock prices have been just going up um, increasing uh, multiple every every year but the earnings have uh, been not keeping pace in many many cases so you know here i i want to take you uh, through you know some examples and some of the things in past in more matured markets what have happened okay um, where you know earnings alone sometimes are also not able to um, take the stocks higher if the valuation is uh, extremely extremely uh, restrictive so here we have an example of twitter uh, you know which on a listing day in 2013 uh, listed at a market cap of 14 billion dollar uh, with a negative ebitda and negative pat but a operating cash flow of say 80 million dollars and in last and on the listing day uh, it went up 70% and closed at a 24 billion dollar market cap or a 45 dollar stock price now 8 years later uh, it has done phenomenally well on a operational side the revenues have gone 7x from 700 million to 5 billion dollar um, and the operating cash flow is now close to 1 billion dollar ebitda is also close to 1 billion dollar which was negative 8 years back at the time of its ipo much like you know our new age companies ipos which have come in with say a negative ebitda etc 
So same way, Twitter has now now Twitter delivers one billion dollar of operating cash flow, one billion dollar of EBITDA, and the market cap is same after eight years of listing. From the listing day close, and even from the offer price, it is just sixty seventy percent up in eight years. And now the price to cash flow multiple is a more saner twenty eight times, or price to sales is more like five six times. Whereas on a listing day close, it was valued at thirty five times price to sales. So you know this is what happens. Where you know earnings have come, growth has come. It is highly popular. One tweet by a popular celebrity like Elon Musk or Virat Kohli creates millions of you know followers liking it, retweeting it, etc., etc. There are hundreds of ways to monetize their plot platform, but this is what they are able to deliver, and this is what they are getting valued at. Same way now, if Netflix is showing some slowdown in its you know future subscriber and and say a um, you know future growth. So suddenly, in the last three years, even though Netflix pat has gone up five x, the market cap is same, you know, and the price to earning is now a thirty five times versus a hundred fifty times or something, you know, three four years back. So so even you know, great companies, these are great companies, great platforms, very popular, still generating a lot of cash flow, but but they are now at more senior multiple. And I want to take you forty years back, you know, to just to uh, uh, prove this point a little bit more. Uh, That even in US, you had similar kind of companies in 1970s across sectors, across consumer sectors, across entertainment sectors, across staples, across discretionary uh, companies like McDonald, Walt Disney, Johnson Johnson, Coca Cola, which you know um, were in fact also called as the Nifty 50 of that time. They were the collection of 50 blue chip stocks in in US, and they started trading at some 45, 50 PE. Uh, okay. um and then for the next 10 years uh, investors made very very little money in these stocks only when you held it for 20 30 years because these companies are still more still uh, you know working really well like a mcdonald is still very famous now in fact they are selling in many developing markets like india etc and doing great uh, coca cola similarly walt disney similar but then you know the double digit kagar return only after 20 years of holding the first 10 years of holding Uh, the multiple adjustment was so much, and they kept on growing their earnings during those ten years. By the way, because they were great companies, they're great companies even today, fifty years later, right? But this is what what kind of happened. Um, and you know now, when we as investors look at these Indian companies trading at such high valuation, we should keep in mind that you know the market is now open for any investor. Whether you as a domestic investor, you can today invest into US stocks very easily through your broker, maybe at a slightly higher cost. you can choose mutual funds which can invest across us stocks and the fii's or the dii's who are investing in india can also similar have similar choices so we have several bigger and better franchises today in us displaying of very high double digit growth more close to 15 to 25% kagar which are trading at less than half of the multiple of our super quality basket you know You have apples of the world, the Microsoft, the Alphabet, which are trading at less than twenty times EV EBITDA, or maybe less than thirty, thirty-five times P, with a very high kind of a you know growth number. There are pockets of overvaluation in US, and mind you, these valuations of US as of you know December thirty-first end is after three years of continuous uh, uh, you know increase in even US markets. So basically, you know, we as investors need to keep these things in mind when we are ascribing very high multiple to any franchise or any company in India. From a from that perspective, then the growth should be very high in those companies where we pay very very high multiples is what we are trying to say. And you know, though our our thesis on this super quality basket is that the multiple, you know. Uh, adjustment may take many many years to play out. It is not a one day phenomena or a one month two month phenomena. It should it may you know the like the way the multiple has increased over last five years uh, continuously and doubled or tripled um, you know uh, as its past average. It may take more time to come down. But what we are seeing is that early signs are visible already. You know so. Uh, in the last forty five days, um, um, you know of this calendar year, while the Nifty. Uh, is flattish uh, from from 31st December to 15th of Feb. The 55 stock basket, which which kind of we selected, is already down nine and a half percent. Okay, uh, despite it having such good quality, some super quality stocks as as you can see in the next chart. So we feel that you know this phenomenon could keep on playing out in the next one or two or three years. 
um and this could be led by multiple reasons which i have listed down here um it could be earnings growth which are good but still it doesn't match up the lofty expectations of the market because market even when the earnings are very good market will keep feeling disappointed in these stocks that earnings didn't come to my expectation similarly higher discounting rates in the dca workings because of the global interest rate hike which i think will happen uh, you know only the quantum needs to be seen um and also because you could have many many more option as the indian economy as a whole is likely to do very well in the next 3 5 years and more sectors will participate many many ignored sectors where because economy was going through a lot of transition lot of reforms many of those sectors were largely thought to be uninvestable okay but now many many investors are coming into uh, more and more sector so that normalization of multiple across sectors may also play out which will which will change this scenario so you know this was the first part which i which i wanted to talk to you about since we have written in detail um on this very topic in our newsletter um and this is something which we also kind of uh, you know follow uh, very diligently when we select any any stock in 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 our portfolios at mona kif so now i will go into the investment style and strategy that we at mona kif follow because it's not something like you know just saying okay don't do this or uh, this is very highly priced but we also as money managers need to have a uh, very rational way of um, uh, looking at uh, investing and then how do we practice that so basically i'll take you through um, you know our investment style and strategy of how exactly we go about it um and and what are the things that we we look for in the stock so first thing uh, you know that we are looking in any company while selecting in the portfolio is a decently long track in a track record so that you know we can make a sound judgment we can do the analysis we can do lot of analysis and see how the company has done through various cycles and within that we try to see the cash flow growth um, you know we give more importance to a operating cash flow growth versus a pnl growth of any metric be it ebitda pat we will give more importance to a ocf growth and ocf growth of course will come if if you have a high uh, conversion from ebitda to ocf so we generally want companies which are displaying high conversion from ebitda to ocf and they are able to grow their ocf secondly what we look for is that incrementally whether the company is able to generate a better return on uh, capital employed or better return on equity than its past so suppose you have a company which is in the past or over the 5 year 7 year generated say a return on equity of 14% 15% but in last 3 years it has started to generate 17% 18% it is incrementally able to improve its return on capital and this may be happening because either it is getting better pricing power either it is getting benefit of brand recall either it is getting benefit of economies of scale or it has done a brownfield expansion which has come at a lower cost there can be multiple reasons across multiple sectors where you can have this kind of a trade being displayed by the company right and the third thing which we try to see is that the growth which is coming in either the cash flow or the incremental roc getting improved how is this being funded is it internally funded to a decently large extent or it is all a kind of a borrowed growth from dilution of equity or or increase in the debt so we generally don't want a very very large dilution and increase in debt we want that the growth is also funded internally by your own cash flows to a decently you know good extent i'm not saying that all the growth can be funded all by internal cash flow sometimes you need to borrow sometimes you need to raise a smart um, you know capital also but um, but effectively uh, you know it should also be your internal cash flow driven so after doing all this you know and we don't want to pay a multiple which is um, restrictive like the way i showed you um, it should be a reasonable you know um, uh, multiple of its growth so if it's a 15 20% growth in cash flow uh, the multiple can be a certain certain magnitude to that and we use various um, valuation methodologies um, like ev2 cash flow dcf ev2 ebitda pe etc etc so you know this is how the funnel works like um, uh, uh, you know when we apply these kind of filters we generally end up working with less than 100 odd companies um, and we we all also look at like more than 1000 crore kind of market cap so um, uh, you know in the end the portfolio of mona kif is always below 20 stocks it's generally a 15 to 20 stock kind of a portfolio 
a lot of concentrated kind of a portfolio and if i were to give you a few examples you know of of all the things that i talked to you about uh, the cash flow kegger uh, the high roi roc getting improved some leadership in the product and services you will find that there are companies which fall in these kind of um, you know matrices across sectors whether you know uh, it's a it's a large company in a wire and cable sector whether it's a company in the road sector which is which is been displaying consistently good numbers high roi rocs and many times you know you will find that these companies also are available at a right valuation or not a very restrictive valuation so generally what we have seen is that um, you know with the filters uh, with the proper evaluation the the companies are available across sectors and you necessarily don't need to you know um, chase or run after the the only the higher priced ones so basically this is how what sums up our investment style and strategy um we are largely looking for companies um, you know where potentially both the earnings growth as well as some multiple increase may lead to uh, you know a return which is close close to being a doubler in 3 years or if the multiple increase is not going to happen then just by the uh, earnings growth we can have a steady compounder uh, we are we are building a portfolio of 15 to 20 stocks so basically we are working on a concentrated way we are looking at only high conviction stories um and yes we are looking at businesses which are which are which are you know showing lot of growth and 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 leadership uh, position in in whatever product and services that they are doing so let me just give you two examples from a current market from the current live market you know uh, where if we apply these kind of filters um you know, do we you know find such kind of company so there is this one housing finance company who has an extremely strong track record across 3 years 5 years 7 years they have always grown their loan book in double digits they have always grown their net interest income in double digits their book value kagar is also always in a high double digit rate and more importantly the asset quality maintained by them is pristine across all the events that had happened in the last 5 years which i showed you in earlier slide of whether demon whether you know nbfc crisis which impacted these guys also per se and the covid crisis they have always had a gross npa which has been well below 1% in fact the average is 0.6 0.7% for them and hence their credit cost always remains low their pad growth always remains high and their roi and roe is always a, a very respectable number and now this kind of a company with a housing cycle turning and hopefully doing very well in the next 3 years is available at a trailing multiple of around 3x and a forward multiple of a 2x price to book whereas when we see across the sector there are so many other affordable housing finance companies which are trading at double to two and a half times of this company um and this is a sizable company with a more than 23 24000 crore loan book so you know we see this kind of a company with long track record where we can track go back in history do a lot of analysis they do have some niche some leadership position and and we get in at a decent level of price where we feel that we can make um, returns from both earning growth as well as a possible uh, multiple expansion you know as the uh, earning start going up with a with a better cycle same way uh, you know i want to give you one more example from a from a industrial business which is a consumable business um which is a refractory business um, and the product basically goes into a cyclical industry steel but the business itself is not never cyclical because it's a small input cost item and without which the steel industry can't work um and there is this one company it's a relatively small company uh, with 1100 crore market cap which has been doing consistently well it has not been on doing any big fireworks but the earnings have always been growing the cash flow has always been improving they have never diluted equity uh, the promoter has a large skin in the game and the return ratios are optically little bit lower because of a goodwill presence which they are you know writing off and they are in the nclt approvals for that after which the uh, return ratios will also be a mid teen double digit kind of a good numbers so you know and they are one among the three player with 40 year track record they have decent leadership position they service all the big steel mills also and where we expect that the earnings growth going forward can be a 15% plus kegger very easily and now this company we are getting at a very very deep discount to other consumable companies across sector and even within its own refractory sector so 
you know we like such kind of uh, situation where in even if the uh, you know the adjustment from the market may take its own sweet time but but in the interim the earnings are growing and the valuation is massively in our favor if valuation adjusts quickly we will make a return very quickly if valuation takes some time to adjust we will make uh, we will make return uh, you know eventually from valuation multiple also and as well as the uh, you know earnings growth are anyways in the interim going to continue so you know this is what our style and strategy is and this is how we build 15 to 20 stocks of these kind of uh, you know uh, businesses um, now quickly i'll take you through our value proposition and our ethos like what we exactly try to do so i i gave you how we select the stock i gave you some examples but then it is more important for a portfolio manager to also do some softer aspects very very well in our view to really generate the alpha so no we have been asked this question a lot that you know why a fund manager is even needed um and what do you guys really do to kind of uh, you know generate alpha how do you guys go about it so this is what it matters in my view uh, basically a fund manager has to do two things one is the betting average wherein that is defined as number of uh, you know positions that he enters and number of positions which go right which is which goes as per his expectation and generally a betting average of more than 65 70% is considered very very high so it is impossible for any fund manager to make 10 calls and get all 10 calls right okay this is a fact of life uh, i'm not telling you anything uh, you know extraordinary or rocket science here it's the fact of life but the most important part is the slugging ratio and the slugging ratio is basically the win loss rate that when you go right how much you make and when you go wrong how much you lose so the good fund managers globally you know and this i have taken from michael mobosen piece um, you know he's a he's a brilliant uh, investor and writer himself so basically you know the win loss rate is the most critical part wherein when you big when you win you are able to realize a decent enough profit of scale and uh, of course if you have a concentrated portfolio at least when you are winning you you will be winning decent you don't have a winning position which is just 1% of the portfolio similarly when you lose when you lose or when you go wrong are you able to act on time and accept your mistake and move ahead with humility and not get carried away by your own bias on that stock so basically you know we we are trying very hard and we always try very hard on this second part uh, which is the slugging ratio that wherever we we are going wrong we can correct that mistake and get out of the position very fast if at all we have made a mistake and where we are right we are able to you know um um ride the position well and we have a concentrated position to make decent enough big money so betting average we of course try our best but you know slugging ratio is which uh, mona kif uh, works very hard uh, to do as best as possible there and this is our first fund which is around 15 month old in the last one year uh, you know we we are at around 43% return and since inception post all expenses and fees we are at around 55 or percent kind of a return um and lastly just take one minute to you know inform you guys that uh, we are um we just have one scheme right now which is a closed ended scheme so since our start uh, 15 months back we have never uh, raised any more money um, you know um, and we have we have never been raising any money in the last 15 months now uh, we've just got a license for our new fund which is mncl capital compounder fund 1 uh, which is currently open um, uh, and which is again going to be a closed ended fund uh, um and, and as such as a monarch ethos and uh, monarch uh, you know uh, uh, kind of ideology we uh, we believe in uh, you know not uh, no, not any hidden or and no entry cost no exit loads um we just have a uh, you know lock ins uh, so that the investors are really long term thinking but we don't have any entry exit load and the fee structure is largely performance driven so that's about it um, uh, you know um, this is what i i wanted to uh, kind of uh, uh, cover um, and um, now over to sivram for for the questions from the audience please sure so please have a little Yeah, the super 
expensive stocks still in growth? What is thinking? What is your input? Yeah, sure. So see, we agree to that point for sure that uh, as a country, um, our profits will grow uh, much, much more, much faster. So see, we are not we are not giving a call here on India per se. Okay, um, or, or saying that you know, look, the whole Indian market is very expensive versus the US or something like that. What I am only saying is that there are a select set of companies. Which even with the Indian demographic and the Indian setup have not been growing their earnings in that way or in that manner for whatever reason, okay? And you have select companies in the US which are having global markets at their disposal, which are able to grow their earnings in a much much faster way, okay? See, today you may say that the US corporate profits to GDP is at a certain high level, but some of the US companies at the globe whole global market. you know at their disposal like amazon or a google they sell to us also mcdonald sells here also okay so because of that you as a investor if you get an option you know wherein in some much more bigger franchises with similar kind of qualities and the multiple being 1/3 or 1/4 the multiple or the valuation excess is just too extreme and see there will be many winners and multi baggers in even these 55 stocks evra so see i have not selected and hand picked and put one one stock i have applied certain filters wherein i have got a basket and then we have shown that you know look in this basket there are many companies uh, you know which are which are not able to live up to their valuation okay so let me give you an example today nestle has reported its numbers okay today only nestle has reported its numbers and the cy21 operating cash flow of nestle has just come at 2250 crore it is a degrowth year on year and the three year cagr in the cash flow of nestle's operating cash flow is just 3 and a half percent seven year cagr in nestle's cash flow is 5% and 10 year cagr in nestle's cash flow is just 7% okay and the stock is trading at 75 times its cash flows so what i'm saying is that i i'm not saying don't buy nestle you you buy nestle if you want okay i am saying is that in all i'm saying is that in any company where you are going and paying so over the top there could be a period where there is a time correction even if nestle were to deliver a 15% operating cash flow cagr versus whatever single digit operating cash flow cagr it is doing you may or may not make return you know you will have to bet on that the multiple will remain completely out of sync with the whole world across sectors across so many other very good franchises that they are available you know so that's the point we are making and um, i take the gentleman's point it is very valid per se which we fully agree with that the indian corporate profits will grow much faster but you have to bet on companies which grow those corporate profits much faster and are available at a very very uh, you know nice valuation uh, you told in your presentation uh, why the the super scanning uh, first uh, valuation uh, stocks have fallen by 9.4% basically someone wants to know that it is because of uh, fias have exited if they come back it will go it will it will cement again it will go to what someone wants to know you know whether the whether the fall in the year to date is is because of uh, fi selling or not see so we 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 are not you know taking any call on 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 say a flow issue or etc all we are saying is that uh, you know whatever um, is our kind of uh, um, analysis or our kind of estimation is that basically uh, the multiple compression could be a multiple year phenomena okay whether in the short term it is because of one factor or another factor i don't even know and in fact my call is not for one month or two months i just shown that data that look the valuation normalization may have started to happen okay what we feel is that yes the multiples may compress because of multiple reasons uh, one mr suraj has written to us uh, after the covid uh, affected but the covid sufferings uh, your portfolio companies have come to pre covid level is what generally they want to know an investor wants to know where your portfolio companies are there uh, vis a vis the pre covid earnings to last quarter earnings so so see uh, many of our portfolio companies as of today um, have earnings which are decently well ahead of uh, their pre covid levels 
um the fund is uh, decently uh, you know um positive on the bfsi space um and that is where you know the earnings um, um, have started to improve in fact several quarters back uh, th- two three quarters back the the you know the asset quality has been consistently improving uh, the the earnings growth the nia growth the pad growth has started to come up and that's where the earnings are substantially higher already versus the pre covid level we do have um, you know several industrial uh, related stocks um, um uh, which where also the earnings are uh, well ahead of uh, the pre covid level so per se uh, in if 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 the uh, participant is asking about our current portfolio um the earnings are uh, you know well ahead of the pre covid levels as we stand today yeah, good 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 to you and uh, the next question uh the your portfolio companies if the valuation goes uh, uh, sky high and it, it becomes a super scary type of a pe valuation will you exit those stocks and look for an alternative yeah so we 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 tend to do that okay sometimes but uh, see this is this is a very very difficult uh, kind of a situation generally uh, for any portfolio manager to decide um, uh whether to completely exit in 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 certain good companies which are going through a nice phase and they are re-rating okay one good thing which happens with us is that generally the starting valuations are not too restrictive okay in terms of the valuation so we don't get into a restrictive valuation zone very very soon that is one secondly if the earnings have also expanded then the valuation expansion zone itself doesn't go into a very very Uh, you know stretch zone very very soon and lastly you know in some cases uh, when you are in the midst of a you know position you may want to size it a little bit down or up okay and you may not want to eliminate it completely but in some cases if the if the earnings growth is not catching up uh, and the valuation is just expanded beyond a point we even exit the positions okay because we are a fund with a 3 to 5 year kind of a term um with a with a 3 to 5 year kind of a view we are not taking bets on bets on companies all the time at 10 year basis and also i mind you you know in a in a in a today's kind of a very disruptive and a highly competitive world it's not easy to always keep taking 10 year calls you know and as i showed you uh, that um, uh, even um, you know some of the great companies which which are even great today also sh- also had their 10 years of you know struggle in terms of the returns in despite earnings so we uh, always um, try to balance uh, between over optimism uh, um, in terms of the earnings growth that can come um, and the valuation which the market is giving and accordingly uh, we we either you know exit some positions or we we size them uh, appropriately as i just explained your fund is a multi cap fund a flexi cap fund and uh, with a bias to mid cap usually we were taught that uh, a mid cap needs to be mid cap fund uh, for that matter needs to be held for in excess of 7 to 10 years to mature but you are talking about 3 to 5 years what is the justification here are you super confident that about uh, the stocks will grow in 3 years so see uh, as i told you um, you know first of all two things about the fund so fund is flexi cap um, you know in that sense and it retains the flexibility of able to invest in large caps in sectors which are completely bettered or ignored and where even the large caps can come cheap okay so what we what we have what we have understood and what we have seen in the last 15 years is that every period okay sivram whatever period you pick um you know there will be one or two large cap sectors which will be completely ignored because of some other other reason it could be bfsi sometime it could be auto sometime it could be it it could be pharma and there even the large caps uh, you know give you a good opportunity so in a flexi cap setup what we do is 30 to 35% of large caps that we keep in the fund these are from these sectors we will not own large caps across sectors but we will own from some sectors where we have very very good fundamentals all all parameters that we look at are getting cleared and the valuation is on, in our favor because in the last 1 to 2 years the sector is under pain because of some other other reason and we will have a view that that pain may may not last for 3 years 5 years it will it will correct itself in the next 1 to 2 years 
on the mid caps that the question has really come in that you know how can you be sure about the mid caps being able to perform in the next 3 to 5 years that is a very very you know um, uh, clear answer there is that we are looking and we are taking companies which are already growing you know be whether it's a mid cap or it's a large cap it's in a it's in its own growth journey okay the journey can be very very long it can become a very big multi bagger like some of the yester year small caps and mid caps have become today's multi baggers or it may you know grow to a certain level and then peak out what we are picking is that within that 25000 crore market cap from 1000 crore to 25000 crore market cap we are picking select mid and small cap companies at a very decent valuation or very cheap valuation in some cases which are growing so whether i hold it for 3 years 5 years these are continuously growing companies and um, and i expect that you know within that period there will be a there um, be a decent value creation in in many of them and that keeps happening you know so uh we don't see that um, um, it's generally a issue that uh, the holding period necessarily needs to be very 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 long um, you know it depends on how and where you are picking basically usually the, the, the earnings growth is say about 20 25% uh, the p normalizes over 3 years is what uh, uh, an investor wants to know and yes uh, what is your opinion this uh, super scary i value stocks if it is sell for about 3 years with a earnings growth of 20 25% p normalizes what is your input on this so, so that's what we showed right um, uh, in the return expectation that uh, first of all many of those 55 companies are not growing their earnings at 25% kagar that is the first thing in the past so now what we did is that we assume that uh, you know um, now from from their trailing 12 month base which in fact is itself high uh, because uh, there was a, a post covid um, uh, uh, you know jump up in in the numbers uh, there was a pent up kind of a demand and and numbers in the last 12 month numbers up to september but still uh, we have assumed a high ebitda kagar of say 20% uh, for more all the companies for the next 3 years and we have taken a ev ebitda multiple coming to 10% premium to 7 year average and mind you the 7 year average mr sivram it's also little bit skewed because the multiple has been going up consistently in last 3 4 years very very strongly so the 7 year average itself is really a high number because last 3 4 years se multiple has been consistently going up so we are even giving a 10% premium to 7 year average we are taking a 20% ebitda kagar and then when we see the stocks then as it showed in my report uh, you know people can access and kind of look at the workings um in many cases in 44 out of 55 stocks that we studied um, uh, uh, the return kagar was less than 10% so see now i am not saying all 55 will do do well or do badly i don't know okay some of those companies will be really good and they can they can grow the earnings and maybe 30% 35% 40% okay they may do well okay they may do well even if they are today at uh, 30 time a bit down 60 time 70 time p but what i'm trying to say is that investors can't be taking the returns from for granted and there will be a very high ask rate of these companies for sure okay uh, if the if the earnings uh, earnings get missed even a little bit here and there you know you might not be able to judge the valuation normalization uh, which may happen in many of these companies and we've given several reasons uh, you know maybe the liquidity environment the interest rate environment the lack of choices uh, to invest in the economy in the indian market across sector all the things were in their favor for the last 5 years last 7 years you know it was a it was a perfect recipe for only them to keep on attracting the flows and now it may be a perfect recipe for all kind of other companies to also attract the flows you know so a market will respect your performance if 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 they are able to really grow tremendously well yes why not they they will keep trading and they'll still create multi bagger returns so this is where the investors need to you know do their hard work and judge on that uh an investor called suman wants to know what is your price to book and price to earning of your portfolio currently Sure. So, uh, see, as of December end, we we held around 19 odd stocks in our portfolio, uh, with the average uh, uh, FY 23 PE of around 17 times. 
uh, and on a trailing basis uh, the pe for the portfolio was around 21 times um, and uh, uh, in terms of the price to book uh, uh, the the forward price to book for the portfolio is uh, somewhere around less than two times it's somewhere around that range and uh, you have very clearly told uh, uh, an history of about 7 to 10 years is required for any company to enter your portfolio still out this is out of syllabus question and what is your take on all the tech companies which have uh, 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 listed recently have fallen 40 50% what is your opinion about uh, uh, those companies which have fallen is there a future or uh, it is doomsday for them no so so um, you know we we don't hold so strong opinions that there's a doomsday um, for any company for that matter um, and i have uh, kind of given my thoughts on on this very question even in you know the pms bazaar state recent newsletter but i'll just just repeat um, you know the kind of uh, view that uh, that we hold for these companies see many of these um, uh, new age businesses um, um have provided solutions which are which are really revolutionary so let's be frank about it okay today um, they have provided solutions which are which have made our lives easier and that's why they they do have so many you know customers who are on board and who are using their platforms on a daily basis correct okay so they have uh, you know provided that however in providing that kind of a solution they have taken a lot of pain at their end to provide that kind of a solution to the customer and the focus on profitability and cash flow has never been there because it was all about you know what kind of a solution you can provide and how many customers you can onboard and how, what can be your reach and can you be the lone winner in the game okay can you be the just the one man or the two men standing in the game like in case of a food delivery okay so and and there was a lot of liquidity sloshing around in terms of venture capital or private equity which has been able to fund these kind of aspirations so they have been able to reach a scale now effectively when you come to a listed market and you get listed okay then the real test of the business model comes and also in our view you know some of the companies the indian companies are yet to see the multiple economic cycle okay so now effectively what we believe is that for any new age company to really succeed the path to profitability or the focus to get to the profitability in a sustainable and a fast manner is a you know key thing which needs to be look out for even if they have to sacrifice on some of their metrics some of their number of customers you know they they should have that path that where can they become profitable and how soon okay and what cost can they incur to become profitable so i have my own doubts that how many of these companies have that kind of a dna okay uh, because of whatever reasons in the way that they have kind of grown um, that they can you know reach that path in a uh, decently uh, quick enough time to justify their valuation which they have already got be it they are down 50% or not uh, but but the absolute valuation at which they are trading at and the valuation at which they were getting the money 2 years back the valuation is still 5 7 times okay uh, so these companies today even after going 40 50% down so effectively you know finally the market you know will balance everything out market will uh, now on keep on evaluating them on their real earnings potential their sustainable earnings potential so from an investor point of view if you really want to play uh, in this space it will be a high risk high return game you have to accept that there will be many misses and a few wins and you may have to look for a you know basket approach and have a view till 2028 2030 that you know by that time whether these companies some of these can have really really large scale and they are you know at that time generating real cash flow otherwise you know you can have uh, experiences like twitter as i showed you twitter today makes 1 billion dollar of cash flow at the ipo time it was having only 80 million dollar of cash flow and negative ebitda today it does does 1 billion dollar of ebitda and 1 billion dollar of cash flow and if you as an investor from the twitter's ipo day close to today you are under water 45 dollar stock is 35 dollar so and it's insanely popular right twitter it is not failed it's not a failed business model the company has not gone anywhere company is very much in fact being used more today than maybe 7 8 years back so so same thing can happen uh, in many of the companies uh, on the new age side 
uh, we don't have um, any you know um, any hard view of who will fail who will succeed who knows uh, but uh, but we really um, you know want to analyze on on the parameters with uh, promoter should a high skin in the game and the path to profitability should be really really clear with a very very big competitive advantages uh, for us to even look of thinking to bet on these things which a lot of uh, other questions have come and uh, because of community of time we will not be able to take uh, everything i will ask question and the unanswered questions we will send it across to you i am very hopeful that you will be able to reply to them so that we can send that uh, answers to the respective investors uh, so that they get the an answer for uh, the questions and on your fund i am going to ask what is your deployment strategy is what someone wants to know if they give a crore will it be deployed uh, what is your deployment do you stagger it or you put it on the day one and what is your deployment strategy so see we generally uh, run a closed ended structure so uh, we don't keep raising money like in the first fund we raise the money in one go the money comes to us and the deployment is basically you know uh, done in a staggered manner over the first you know few months of the fund the fund has a 3 year plus 2 year horizon uh, but the but the portfolio construction for the fund which is this up to 20 stock portfolio construction can take some time but it will not be a long very long time because generally we will always have a identified set of investments and the portfolio at any given point of time across market levels so we don't try to you know um, uh, invest uh, invest or stagger the um, investments based on any big market view uh, we don't try to you know make a lot of market view or or time the market uh but we will uh, be able to you know deploy the funds um, over the over the first few weeks or first four to six weeks uh when when we you know start our fund so so that's the deployment strategy but uh, but generally uh we can keep some cash handy for 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 some stocks uh, if at all we we have valuation excesses across the board and and some of our stocks which we like are you know not in our um, target range so that uh, flexibility we we generally exercise but um, otherwise we build it as as i just mentioned abhishek and in fact it was a very uh, a paradigm shift uh, for me after hearing you and it was a very good thoughts uh, i have learned a lot from uh, this webinar i hope it was very useful for the investors also who have listened to you thank you very much uh, for you for your time abhishek and i would like to thank all the participants who have participated in this god bless all thank you very much thanks a lot thanks thanks pms bazaar and thanks to all the investors who took time to listen to us thank you